Yeah, so in the past two years uh, working on the exhibit, uh, Tony and I have had many discussions uh, in his studio, uh, on the phone and over email. And several months ago, Tony and I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk and we deliberated on how he and I got to where we are in our careers. Uh, we talked about our childhoods, uh, we talked about going to school, graduating from college, our parents, uh, Tony's father is here tonight. Uh, we talked about uh, getting our, our dream jobs and starting our families. And uh, to Tony commented that he felt uh, he was very lucky throughout his life, uh, perhaps that his career had been influenced through a series of circumstances and coincidences, uh, just being in the right place at the right time. Um, and I did something you don't normally do with a when you're working with a living artist. Uh, I disagreed with him. Um, <laughs> I told him I don't believe in luck. Um, surely many things are out of our control and can have a negative impact on our lives, often profoundly. Uh, but success can be determined by what we know, who we are, and who there is to help and guide us. Through developing the exhibit, I found that Tony and I have a lot in common. Although our upbringing, upbringings were vastly different, we have both achieved success in our fields, uh, Tony clearly much more so. Um, he's a very talented artist and storyteller, as you can see in the exhibition and in the books he has written. Um, but his success did not come overnight. He possesses a charming personality and has a tremendous support group to guide him through his life. Uh, from his parents who encouraged him from a young age, to his school teachers who pushed him and inspired him. Uh, to his wife Angela, who's here, who is his tireless champion. Um, but luck didn't help him. It was Tony's tireless determination to spend his summers growing up drawing every day of the summer, cataloging insects and creating imaginary worlds by himself, bugging his high school art teacher to let him create an art project that would change his life. Uh, his dedication to harassing the people at Dungeons and Dragons when they sent him rejection letter after rejection letter <laughs> until they finally gave up and gave him a job. Uh, risking his career by leaving D&D &D to become a children's book author. Through 25 years of fighting for his desires and working days and weeks on end, Tony has achieved what he dreamed of as a boy growing up in Jupiter, Florida. And uh, no man is an island, as they say. I believe as long as you have that encouragement, imagination, and determination, and are able to navigate whatever seemingly insurmountable obstacles life throws at you, you can accomplish nearly anything. The title of the exhibit, as you know, is Never Abandon Imagination. And that's not just a glib saying we included. Um, it's a command. It's really a, a directive to everyone who passes through the gallery to find what it is that inspires you now or as a child. Think about that thing that inspires you. Really think about it. Follow the desire, never give up, and go up to the people who have your back, Angela, Tony's father. Give them a hug and inspire them as Tony and I have been inspired. Now, to the guest of honor. Tony DiCiolizzi began his career illustrating the role-playing games Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering before embarking on the second phase of his career in children's literature. Just as his early work on D&D and Magic is treasured by devoted fans of the gaming genre, his award-winning books, Ted, The Spiderwick Chronicles, Kenny and the Dragon, Spider and the Fly, The Story of Diva and Flea, The Wanda Trilogy, those have all inspired a new generation of young readers. Uh, with an artistic style influenced by legendary illustrators such as Norman Rockwell, Arthur Rackham, and Windsor McKay, this exhibition hopefully shows how those visionaries shaped Tony's magical tales through original artwork and interactive displays. Uh, Tony is an author and an illustrator who has been on the New York Times bestseller list many times over. He's won a Caldecott Honor Award for his 2002 book, The Spider and the Fly, and he co-wrote The Spiderwick Chronicles, which has sold nearly 20 million copies and has been translated into 31 languages and was made into a successful feature film. He has a new book coming out this year titled The Broken Ornament, which features a fairy named Tinsel. Hopefully he'll talk about that. So on behalf of the Norman Rockwell Museum, I am thrilled to introduce my good friend, Tony DiCiolizzi. Saturday night, there's nothing else better going on in Stockbridge. <laughs> You guys are here. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was remembering, Jesse, when, when Angela and I lived in Brooklyn, um, this guy, we were doing a signing for Magic the Gathering, and this guy came up to me and said, um, you know, I'm an actual living wizard. <laughs> okay, really? Yeah, I'm the only living wizard in New York City. And I was like, wow. And he goes, I just want to tell you, 
Your art is so awesome, it's like the badass days of yore. And I was like, that is what we should have titled this exhibition, <laughs> Art from the Badass Days of Yore. <laughs> I, um, I'm super excited to be here um, and talk a little bit about what I do and why I do. I'm, I'm doubly honored, not only is my wife and daughter here tonight, but my dad, my uncle and his wife, and my Aunt Fran is here. They came up, so I got some family here tonight, so it's, it means a lot to me to be here. And hopefully we'll have a good time. I'll try to cover some things that I, I, I think you might find interesting, I hope. Um, otherwise, I'm sure they'll refund your money at the uh, door, <laughs> or not. Um, okay, so as Jesse said, I have been making um, books and illustrating for nearly, uh, for over 25 years now at this point. I started out um, illustrating for games such as Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering, and I always had this dream of um, il you know, writing and illustrating books for children. It's something that came to me at a very young age. And, um, wow, it's a lot of work. I get tired just looking at it all. I, um, I'm super excited and honored to be able to have uh, this work showcased here uh, and the museum um, is an incredible honor. I think mostly because I've come to this museum so many times to see the art of, of obviously of Norman Rockwell, but of Maxville Parish and and um, J.C. Leindecker and and C. Wyeth and many of the other amazing uh, illustrators um, that inspired me. And so the idea of, of the, even the notion of me hanging on these walls. Um, has, has meant a lot, a tremendous amount to me, um, perhaps more than Jesse and Stephanie and Lori and the entire gang will ever know. Um, but I, when you do this and you kind of comb back through the years of your life and these 25 years of making illustrations, you start to, um, you, I, I was struck with a, a sense of reflection and thought and, and how I got here. I am like a shark. I cannot stop moving forward because if I do, I will perish. I am always working, always creating, always writing, always coming up with stories. I never have writer's block, knock on wood. I never have illustration block. If I see a challenge, I figure out how to overcome that challenge. It's just how I'm hardwired. But in pulling the artwork out of the flat files and out of the closet and out of old boxes and things like that to look at the artwork that would reflect my journey here, it had me wondering how the heck I got here. Um, it's sometimes I think about it, I reflect back, but not too often. And so I, I thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about how I did get here and why I'm standing here in front of you guys tonight telling you my stories. And so I, when I had to think back, I thought of my daughter, who's in fifth grade, and I thought of something to me in fifth grade called book reports. You guys, have book, you guys remember book reports, right? <laughs> book reports. We had to do in the 70s oral book reports. Do you guys, do anyone have to do oral book reports? You guys remember, does anyone remember what an oral book report is? Yes? It looks like this. This is a lot what an oral book report <laughs> looks like. You stand in front of a lot of people you don't really know or like. You open your mouth and you have to, you know, encounter some pain. And uh, I, uh, I was really lousy at these, these oral book reports that we had to do in fifth grade. And let me show you, let me, let me, set, let me rewind a little bit. Let's get to fifth grade. <laughs> that is me in fifth grade, same age as you, Soph. My head was gigantic. <laughs> if you actually look at the ratio of my head to my shoulders, it's the same size it is now, but it was on a little tiny 70 pound body. I'd just be walking around like. <laughs> My parents, in their infinite wisdom, thought, God, his head is really big. Maybe if we put really big glasses on him, <laughs> his head will look smaller. But no, big glasses. Uh, a bad Luke Skywalker haircut, and um, yes, this is it. This is 1979. I was in fifth grade. Oh, man. I wish I could rock that Vans t-shirt now. That would just be creepy with, uh, with all the little holes. Like, that was a fashion because I'm really working out and sweating a lot, so I need to have ventilation with this shirt on. 
I was drawing a lot. I was drawing um, kind of your standard uh, stock things in grade school, dinosaurs. You can see I was very excited about Tyrannosaurus rex, not so much about Triceratops. He's kind of just, <laughs> I think I was getting tired. Um, I drew a lot of insects. I grew up in South Florida. Has anyone been to South Florida before? It's very hot. It's filled with old people and insects. That's, you know, and some lizards. In fact, I kind of think the old people go down there and they turn into lizards. I think that's what happens. They get that, that thing on their neck and it gets longer and longer. Ah, oh, the heat. And the, oh, oh, this is so much better. Oh, I love. Oh, I'm not going to use the back legs anyway. <laughs> and there were a lot, of, a lot of bugs, a lot of insects. I collected a lot of insects and did drawings. Thankfully, I didn't collect these termites from our house, but I did do, uh, I did do a lot of drawings. And of course, I did drawings from a little known movie that came out in the 70s. You guys probably haven't heard of this one. Um, Star Wars came out in 1977. I was eight years old when it came out. Um, like nine billion other people on the planet, it had a profound effect. If you look very closely at this slide, um, you will see that it is, it looks like a Christmas. It's a holiday craft sale. That's, I, uh, I, I was going to like burn that out when I scanned it, but I thought, you know, that actually says, there's a lot of story there, that I'm literally drawing on scraps of old flyers. Um, that's kind of how I was. Uh, fifth grade, this is uh, what it looked like back in 1979. Extra points if you can find me. Check it out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, my fifth grade teacher's name was Ray Strasberger. Uh, Mr. Strasberger was amazing. Now, of course, because his name was Strasberger, we called him names like hamburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburglar, and all those other kind of derivatives. He loved that. I think he thought that was really, really awesome. Um, I went to a, a public school down in Hope Sound. Uh, it's on the east coast of Florida. and. Um, so we, we did a lot of things. We did typical things you did in, in fifth grade, including these book reports, right? So we had a great list of books on our book reports. We had uh, The Phantom Tollbooth, which is a great book. I don't know if anyone's read that one. We had The Hobbit, which I hear is quite popular. I don't know. Maybe they'll make a movie of that. Um, let me think of what The Book of Three and The Black Cauldron. Those were also on our reading list. I picked an easier book. I picked this one. For my, anyone read this book, The Mouse and the Motorcycle by Beverly Cleary? She turned, boy, she's like 102 now. She's like a national treasure. She's older than Norman Rockwell. Um, this is how my oral book report went in fifth grade. My name is uh, Tony DiTolizzi. Duh. And my book report is on The Mouse and the Motorcycle by Beverly Cleary. It's a book about a mouse and a motorcycle. <laughs> Thank you very much. And my teacher, Mr. Shabbat, Tony, Tony, what is the mouse's name? Uh, um, Fonzie? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And how, where, how did he get the motorcycle? Where did he find the motorcycle? Um, uh, Kmart? I was lousy at book reports, and the reason I was lousy was somehow something had changed in the books that we were reading in third and fourth grade, and the books that were now on our list in fifth grade. Now, to be fair, Mouse and the Motorcycle does have illustrations in it. Here's an illustration of the mouse. I don't know if you guys can see that, but it also had a lot of pages of this. And this was hard for me. For some reason, it had changed. Now, in third and fourth grade, one of my favorite book series was Frog and Toad are Friends. Has anyone ever read Frog and Toad are Friends by Arnold Lobel? Yeah, look, even the camera guy's holding his hand. It's awesome. I love Frog and Toad are Friends. Here's why I loved Frog and Toad are Friends. There was a picture, an illustration, on every single page. So if you didn't understand what was going on in the words, you saw an illustration that would help you comprehend what was going on. For instance, you would see Frog and Toad, and Frog would be like, Hi, Toad, what's going on? He always had like a Kermit the Frog voice in my mind when I read him. And Toad would be looking at his suit going, I have lost a button <laughs> in my polyester leisure suit. <laughs> and because I didn't know words like polyester or leisure suit, I could look at the illustration and assume it was probably a popular trend from the late 1970s that was worn primarily among men. Um, 
No, the illustrations always helped me. But somehow, when I got to these books, not so many illustrations. And I needed a picture to help me comprehend what was going on. So Mr. Strasberger pulls me aside one day, and he makes a deal with me. He says, Tony, I know you like to draw. I see you drawing in my class all the time. I want you to do a drawing from the mouse and the motorcycle. You can't copy it. You have to come up with a drawing of your own. And if you do that, I will give you extra credit. Deal? Deal. So now I went back to the mouse and the motorcycle. But this time, instead of reading a story, I was reading instructions, directions. What would I draw? Would I, would, would I draw Keith in the day he and his family came to the hotel and he meets Ralph the mouse and Keith shows him his toy motorcycle? Maybe I'd show him how the motorcycle moves by just grabbing the handlebars and going boom, boom. Maybe, when Ralph, maybe I should draw when Ralph falls in the waste paper basket. Maybe I should draw when Ralph gets sucked up by the vacuum cleaner. Maybe I should draw when Ralph goes get the aspirin because Keith's got a fever and he might actually die. Holy cow, I finished the book. I did an illustration of my own, and I got a good grade, and on I went. But I didn't realize what an impact that would have on me. You don't realize the impact some of these things have on you until you're older, and you look over your shoulder, and you see the stars that light up your travels, your journey that takes you from one place to another. And back in 1979, there is my fifth grade teacher in a public school in Podunk, Florida, who says, why don't you do a drawing? Maybe you'd like it, and I'll give you extra credit. Mr. Strasberger. Let's move forward a couple years. Seventh grade, boy, weren't those great years? <laughs> yeah, middle school. So much fun. Look at that, look at all that beautiful hair. Hair, beautiful hair, there I am. <laughs> Check it out. Tony Di Trulisi next to the only other Italian girl in our school, Carla Di Geronimo. Carla Di Geronimo. Because the classes were alphabetized, not only was Carla in all my classes, we often sat next to each other. Carla had amazing hair. Look at those feathers. Look at that smile. Look at that blue eyeshadow. It's there. I promise you, it's there. Man, Carla and I were really good friends. Not really. Um, <laughs> and the reason we weren't good friends are my statistics. They were horrible. I was a level 12 geek at this point, and really my only special ability was drawing, cracking jokes, and mouth farts. That was about all I was good for. <laughs> Now, if you don't know what this statistic sheet is next to me, I will show you what it is from. It's from a thing that came out in the 80s, and maybe you've heard of it. Your dungeon master has placed you in a dreadfully precarious position. You're playing the most phenomenal game ever created. Your skin grows cold from your first glimpse of the enormous beast. It's a product of your imagination. Survival depends on a quick, decisive move. Your choices are limited. Stand and fight, or run. Use your lightning bolt. Victory is yours. Win the treasure. TSR Hobbies. Dungeons and Dragons games. Products of your imagination. Products of your imagination. What is that guy's voice? <laughs> Brother, you are in the living the most incredible game ever invented in time. I loved Dungeons and Dragons. I love that kid's hair. Um, Dungeons and Dragons was incredibly huge in the early 1980s. It seemed like everywhere you went, everyone was playing it. And then a year later, they were done, and they were doing Rubik's Cubes and other stuff. But it had a lasting effect on me. I, um, at this point, when I was 12, I was copying a lot of drawings out of the Dungeons & Dragons books. Here's a couple nice renderings. Some of these were actually traced, I might add. Um, I would use an opaque projector and blow them up onto the wall and trace them. It's how I did learn to do a lot of my drawing early on. I was also in Boy Scouts at this time, another connection I, I feel strongly about with uh, Norman Rockwell. And, um, I loved nature. I think I said growing up in Florida, it's, there's insects this big, there's lizards this big, and there's birds. Of course, the ocean is, has, is everywhere. And so I collected these old little field guides 
um, that had just, I loved looking through these little books and trying to find all the animals that I would see in them. And oftentimes I would also draw some of the uh, animals I saw. This is a, a copy from uh, John James Audubon, Ivory, Pil Ivory Build Woodpeckers. And of course, I was still a fan of this uh, not as well-known movie. I don't think that people don't like Empire Strikes Back as much. I mean, no, I was a huge fan. I don't understand why Carla didn't like me. <laughs> I got Star Wars, I got Bugs, I got Dungeons and Dragons. Still rocking those giant glasses, Dad. Thanks, thanks on that, that was good. In fact, I think they would just break in the middle. I would try to play football and I'd be like, I got it, I got it, bam! It was always right in the middle. Oh, they broke it, they broke in the middle. You would like either tape it or like if they were metal frames, you'd just solder it. There'd be a big ball of solder right in the middle. They'd scrape my bridge of mind. Yeah, just suck it up. Just suck it up. And get back out on the field. Ah, I'm gonna draw Star Wars. Um, now, during summer... <laughs> it's an intervention, Dad. I don't know if you know that that's what's going to go down in a little bit. Um, <laughs> This, the, during, the, during the summers, as Jesse mentioned, I liked doing projects. And, um, because if you've been to the summers in Florida, it, it, they're very warm. It's not <laughs> a little different than what it's like here in the summer. And, I, and so what you want, we literally had one air conditioner in our house. It was this big, and it was kind of in the corner, and it would kind of All right, I'm done for a little while, I gotta take a break. I mean, that was it, it was, it was this tiny air conditioner, but it was better than being in this. Those are the old people, by the way, that moved down there. So one summer, I, I'm the oldest of three. I've, I have a younger sister and a younger brother, and my mom stayed at home to raise us kids. So during this time, um, my sister would have been, I don't know, seven, eight. My brother would have been really young, which meant my mom would be just doing this. Ah, get out of the house. So I was like, it's too hot. I don't want to go outside. So she said, fine, go in your room, but do something creative. I don't care what you do. Just get out of my hair. So I go into my room. So bored. Bored. What am I going to do? <laughs> Nothing. You can't watch TV. You can't play Atari. So I started looking at the stuff in my room. Now, there was a lot of stuff in my room at the time, as I showed you. There was Dungeons and Dragons. There were these field guides. So I was like, mm, maybe I'll draw. So I did a couple drawings. Took some old notebook paper and started drawing some monsters. Right? Kind of like Dungeons and Dragons. Here's an ice dragon. But then I thought, what if I take the stuff in the field guides that I was reading and start writing about these monsters that I was coming up with? I was 12 years old, and then I was like, well, where are all these monsters live? They must live somewhere special. So I came up with this like whole land where all these monsters live, and by the end of the summer, I had filled an entire notebook. And this notebook that I created when I was 12 became this. And now I want to show you something. I want you to count how many times you hear the word book. The last place Jared Grace wanted to be I know this house isn't perfect, but we can make it work. was stuck here. Oh, the house? Yeah, it's great. You like big creepy houses in the middle of nowhere. Stop acting like a jerk! But like any old house... Check it out. This one has its secrets. Don't you want to know where this thing goes? Not really. soon see that there are fantastical creatures living among us. Why can't I see you? You don't see us. Now you do. But only if we want you to. But be forewarned. A rare few are, quite frankly, to be feared. Ah! You took a fuck! I put a note right on the cover! Can't you read? 
all around us. Goblins, trolls, sprites. You gotta believe me. Impossible. You're such a liar. Keep the book safe from the ogre. Ogre? Give me the book! Spiderwick Chronicles. Did I hit somebody? Yes. Thank you. Dude, book, 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 book. Give me the book. They made a movie about a book. <laughs> Suckers. <laughs> the movie cost them millions. It went on to make millions. There were video games. There were happy meals. It just got really ridiculous. And the whole time that I was on the red carpet and out promoting the film with Holly, every t we'd go places and the reporters would go, what do you think, how does it feel to have a, a movie made of your book? And all I could think about was this. 12 years old, bored, in my bedroom in hot Florida. Boredom. When's the last time anybody was bored? I mean, really bored. I don't know. I'm a little worried, guys, because when I get the slightest inkling of being bored, I pick up my phone, I check my email, I binge watch an entire episode of, or a season of Stranger Things. It's really hard to be bored. I have to remind myself that being bored created this special thing that being bored allowed me to reconcile a lot of the stuff that was in my head. It allowed me to put it in boxes and file it away in my brain so that I could access it later. It allowed me to take a box of this, Natural History, and this, Dungeons and Dragons, and pour the contents out on the same table and mix it up and make something new. That's what boredom got for me. That's what boredom continues to get me to this day. I think boredom is partly the key to being creative. I think when we're bored, we're forced to be mentally resourceful. That's my theory. Never abandon imagination. How much does this mean to me? Well, every single book that I make is kind of like a little movie to me. I change my style. I, I use different mediums. I push myself and I listen to the story. What is the story asking me to do? How can I best convey the mood and the feeling of the story with the mediums that I use? Think of it like music, right? Think of it like an electric guitar or an acoustic guitar. When you hear the Beatles play yesterday, you don't want an electric guitar. You want an acoustic guitar. It's a reflection. It's a song, it's, it's mournful, it's melancholy. You don't need an electric guitar shredding on top of that. It's the same way with the mediums that I use for the stories that I want to tell. But one thing I always do is fill them, not just full of imagination, but the best quality, the best artwork that I can create. Here's why. I noticed something that happened when I was this tall to when I'm this tall. And now this tall, but pretty soon I guess I'll start going back this way. <laughs> this was my favorite video game growing up. Does anyone know what this video game is? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Adventure, Adventure for the Atari 2600. Holy cow, this game. This game. Wait, I get to be the yellow dot? And I can go anywhere? I can pick, like if I walk next to the key, I pick the key up? And then I can, oh, dude, it's never, ever going to get better than this. <laughs> this is a screen still from Dragon Age Inquisition. This is not even a new game. This game's a couple years old. This 
was one of my favorite movies growing up. Walt Disney's rendition of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I love this. I love the songs. I love the voices. I love the weirdness. I love the wackiness. I loved Mary Blair's concept art. I loved this movie when it would come on the wide world of Disney at, at, on Fridays or Sundays or whatever. This was the Cheshire Cat from Tim Burton's version. Every single hair, every single yellow tooth, Every whisker is rendered perfectly. Maybe books have a lot more in competition with our pastimes than we thought because these other mediums have grown. They have changed. They have evolved. They become flashier. They become more interesting. And yet, the irony is, this movie, which grossed five gabillion dollars, starring Johnny Depp, was based on this book that was written over 150 years ago by Charles Dodson, known as Lewis Carroll, and an illustrator named Sir John Tenniel. He was knighted. And the thing that I think about when I think about this book is that so many generations have enjoyed this story, and yet no one knows Lewis Carroll. No one knows Sir John Tenniel. You don't have to physically know the author or the illustrator to get the magic out of a book. That's the thing that books can do. They ask you to imagine. Because when you think about it, all a book is is a bunch of symbols in black ink printed in rows on pulped paper, wood pulp. All the pictures are, when you look at them under a magnifying glass, are four color dots, black, yellow, blue and red, arranged in an order that give the image, the illusion of an image. And yet when we read these stories, we're taken to certain places. We're taken to certain times. We're taken on adventures and journeys. We learn facts. We read and enjoy fiction. And that to me is something of a magic power that books have that no other medium has been able to quite figure out. And that is why I've dedicated my life to creating books with pictures. Not just for me, old Tony, standing here, for that guy. <laughs> what does that guy want? What does 10-year-old Tony want that old Tony can make? Think about that. What's the one thing you wish existed in the world that still doesn't? Who's to say you're not the person to make that thing? Years and years ago, people never believed we'd make it to the moon. And we did. We still haven't even gotten to the bottom of the ocean, but people are figuring out how to do it. They're figuring out how to go to Mars. They're imagining micro nanorobots injected into the body that will fight cancers and sicknesses that ail and plague us. Imagination is the seed that pushes us as a species, as the caretakers of the planets, to the next level. And I feel like imagination has to be cultivated as soon as we're born. I was never discouraged from drawing or having my head in the clouds, but there were many years in school that I wasn't encouraged. I am lucky. I'm lucky because when I was a kid, I had adults in my life who saw something in me when I did not see it. People like my parents, my fifth grade teacher, Ray Strasberger, my middle grade art teacher, Tom Prostopnik, and my high school art teacher, Tom Wetzel, the adults that were in my life that helped steer it when I could not control it. That is how I'm lucky, and that is how I am trying to affect and influence and inspire the next generation. Thank you guys so much.